This was the first launch coaster in the world. Built by the pioneer of modern roller coasters. It's just a train on a straight track, no big deal, right? But then there's a loop, and we need to get it through there. So they used a very big cable. And it's attached to an even bigger counterweight. Now get ready. Here we go. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Ryan Ride Mechanic channel. How the heck are you doing today? Welcome back, or if it's your first time, welcome to the channel. I appreciate you being here. appreciate everyone watching. Uh, today's video, I wanted to talk about weight drop shuttle coasters. Yes, that's right. It's been a long time coming for this one, but I want to talk about the weight drop style shuttle coasters. Now, these were, in case you don't know, these were 14 of these, I believe it was made by Schwarzkopf. These were the original 14 shuttle coasters that were made that used a counterweight to propel the car forward. So I thought about a lot of different ways of doing this video and trying to figure out visual representations. Is there gimmicks I could use? Can I do something to kind of explain how everything works? And without like a really advanced animation, essentially, uh, there wasn't a really good way to do this, so I've actually been dragging my feet on this video for a very long time, uh, trying to think of the next best thing to do. And uh, I, I really couldn't figure it out, and it's it's been eating at me in the back because I had the project sitting there, and I'm just like, ugh. So I figured it's just as good as time as any just to go ahead and like, all right. So to start, you kind of have to know everything, and then it kind of works together and you'll it'll, it'll start putting the pieces of the ride together. So I'm going to start off with some basic descriptions of what it is. So the Schwarzkopf shuttle launch, there was, there's been a bunch of these rides made, but there was predominantly two styles that came out. The very first style was the weight drop style, which I'm going over today. And then its bigger brother came out, and this was the more popular flywheel style that used a large flywheel to accelerate the train. Now, this was these were launch trains, launch coasters, back before LIM and LSM technology really came on board. So there wasn't really a good way to do this yet. So these are kind of rare creatures. And then the weight drops are even rarer because they were only made for a very short period of time. They are extremely maintenance intensive. There is a lot of very, very, very big parts on these things. And because of that, there is a lot of money tied up in those things as well. Um, the, the main clutch at the end of the track, and I'll get into these components later, I just kind of wanted to say, the main truck at the end of the track was I was told was just about a hundred thousand dollars to replace the lining on the clutch and it needed to be done a couple times a year from what I understand uh, so on the lines I have second third fourth and fifth hand information on these things uh, I've talked with a couple of people I was able to talk with a couple of people that have worked on them directly I've talked with uh, some of some of you out there. I've talked with some operators and people like that uh, that have helped me gain some information on some things. So, and then just like every roller coaster out there, every ride out there that I've ever done a video on, everything is kind of different. Manufacturers never really do things the same way twice. So that produced an added element of change where one person said it was done this way. Another person said it was done that way. Well, they're both right. Neither one of them's wrong because the manufacturer changed their mind in the middle of it and they did it one way or the other. So I tried to basically focus on the big components, the big terminology, and really tried to like get something that was kind of universal that can say like, look, as far as I could tell, this applied to most or a lot of the weight drop style coasters that are out there. 
So these coasters were in line, straight line. You, you only needed a plot of land about uh, 30 feet wide and pretty long. I believe they were close to 800 feet long, which is fairly, fairly decent. And uh, the way these were set up is that there was a station building, which is where you loaded, the launch track, which is where you accelerated, and the launch track actually started in the station building because you accelerated from a dead stop in the station. And then there was a loop, and on the far side there was a 70 degree tilted spike up there. And then the same on the back side behind the station, there was another 70 degree spike back there as well. You'll see throughout this video, I use a lot of videos from two particular people. The first one is Kenobi Fan. I hope I'm saying that right. Probably not. Um, but the way I see it, it looks like Kenobi Fan. Sorry if I'm getting that wrong. Where a bulk of the video is going to come from is a gentleman by the name of David Jealous. And I put these links in the description as well. Uh, David did a lot of filming for, I believe it was another project. I honestly think it was the one that Great America Parks did. There was a YouTube video put out by a channel, Great America Parks, and they did a anniversary special for the Tidal Wave. Amazing video. It was great. And the, the, a lot of my knowledge, by the way, for this video comes from the ride I grew up on, which was the Tidal Wave at Great America in Northern California. So when I reference things, that's the bulk of my remembering what happened. Uh, was coming from Great America in Northern California. But the uh, the video that was put out was like a 25th anniversary or something along those lines of the tidal wave. And they did a really good job. They got lots of footage, which I believe, looking at the two footages side by side, I believe that footage they used there was David's um, because the two look pretty spot on. But, you know, there's only so many ways you could also record a ride, so take it with a grain of salt there as well. Um, but they talked with maintenance mechanics. They talked with the maintenance crew. They actually followed some of the maintenance guys around there. So if you like this video, I'll leave links to these videos as well. But if you like this video, for sure, go to these other channels and watch those videos because that is, they have a lot of other stuff. And that, that anniversary video for the tidal wave is absolutely amazing to watch because they got some really good footage in there. And they did a really good job at it. So definitely something to go see uh, after this one. It's it's amazing to go watch. And then the, uh, the train on the track is a standard Schwarzkopf train. I don't know what else can I say about it. Uh, it was the standard style. You've seen them pretty much used on everything. Schwarzkopf didn't make very different models of this particular train. Um, so it's kind of the same thing, but you know, when you look at it, you, you can, as soon as you see it, you're like, yeah, that's, that's a Schwarzkopf. I, I can see that one right there. It was my most all Schwarzkopf's were, it was a single lap bar style train and it had normal wheel carriers used just like most of them. It used all nylon wheels. And then the only thing different from this compared to most of the other trains is that there was no chain dog. There was no any rollback because it was a launch coaster. So they had a catch pickup in the very back of the train. And I'll get to that a little bit later on, but that's an interesting little component by itself. On the front tower, behind the loop, you go through the loop and go up that 70 degree spike. Unlike a normal ride where it's just got a support column holding that 70 degree, degree spike up, which is the way it is in the back of the ride as well. So in the back of the ride, there's just vertical poles holding up that column. But in the front of the ride, through the loop on there, there is a very large tube underneath that column. And that's the quickest way, if you ever look at one of these rides from a distance, and you, wanted, you say, I wonder if that's a weight drop or a flywheel style. That's the quickest way to ID it right there. Simply just look at that front tower that's in front of the loop. And then as soon as you see that, if you don't see any big, massive tube sitting underneath that tower, then it's a flywheel. If you see a big tube with a big pulley on top, it's a weight drop. 
pretty simple, right? So inside that tube, there is a big counterweight, really, really big counterweight. Uh, when I worked at my last place, we actually had that ride for a very short period of time in our parking lot. <laughs> if anyone's familiar with coasters in Northern California at all, I mean, and you're watching this channel, you already know where I worked, right? So, but that's always one of my things. It's like, I don't want to say it just because I don't want to be affiliated with it. I don't want to, the people to think that I represent that park or that company, which I do not. I do this all on my own. I don't represent anybody else. Uh, so that's why, I, uh, for people wondering, that's why I never mention exactly where I worked because it's easy to figure out, but uh, I don't want anyone to think that I'm representing that company or that park, which I am not. Uh, when I talk about things, I generalize a lot of stuff to keep some of the nitty gritty out of there, to keep everything on a level playing field. But while I was there, we had the tidal wave. Actually, when it was taken out of Great America, the crew that dismantled the tidal wave actually brought it to our park because we were getting a Schwarzkopf traveling roller coaster put in at our park. And the, the upper management and the, and the corporation I worked for I believe they thought that they could use some of the parts and pieces off the tidal wave. So I'm not sure if money changed hands in the background, if they paid for the trucking costs, whatever, but basically about half to three quarters of that ride showed up in the parking lot. And for me, it was like, oh yeah, I was like a kid in a candy store. I would work and then I would go up to the parking lot and I would wander around the parking lot with all the tidal wave parts sitting there because I was like, wow. This this was amazing to see for me. It was amazing to be up close, to be able to touch the parts, to see how big they actually were in person. Um, it lost some of its awe factor from already working at an amusement park at that point in time because I had gotten a lot of that already out of my system. You know, when you could actually, that first time you can go up and, and touch a roller coaster track or the first time you could climb on a track or the first time you have to climb on a track or the second time you have to climb on the track, or the third time you have to climb to the top of the loop because you see rust. What was I talking about? Oh yeah, shuttle loop. Anyways, so it was very interesting to go up there and see that coaster up close. There was no train. There was a couple components that I really had questions about that weren't there, which I was like, dang it. Um, and if anybody in the video the comments has some pictures of these things, please share them with me. If you want, give me permission, I'll post them to YouTube or something, or we could, you could just post them in the comments, whatever, if you have links to them. But so one of the things that I still have never seen for all the investigation I've done, all the talking, all the, everyone I've talked with, I have never seen the pusher car which is the technical term from Schwarzkopf is an acceleration sled. Uh, the, the actual verbiage that was taught to the crew that the crew used and is actually in the manual is Bob, B-O-B, -B, Bob. So I have never seen the Bob outside of the ride. So the, the, some of the stuff I'll talk about for the Bob I had to get from other people. I had to ask the question to them. They gave me the answer. So I was like, okay, because I have to I have to build this ride in my head in order to talk about it because I have most of it, but I was missing some pieces of it. All right, back to the counterweight. I'm sorry. Counterweight in the back tower. When that ride showed up there, there was this thing sitting in the corner and I walked over to it. I'm like, what is this? And I went to it. It was the counterweight. It was sitting there in the parking lot. And I was like, how heavy is this? And I, I was like, let's see. I looked all around it and it turns out it was just a big drum. Not like a, well, imagine like a, a barrel, like an oil drum, empty. It was that, but it was big. It was like 
I can't remember. I don't I didn't have an exact size on it, but it was like 10 feet in diameter and like 20 feet long. It was really big. Um, there's verbiage on websites that I believe the websites uh, a lot of times have the verbiage around that counterweight to be between roughly 75 to 80 tons. So in I'm used to working in pounds, right? So tons are easy because you just take whatever the number is, multiply it by two. So the counterweight was roughly 160,000 pounds. That's how big the counterweight was inside there. And then they used pulleys wrapped around the inside. So it wasn't the cable would just go over the top and come straight down and hold on to the counterweight. It was actually the pulley would go over the top come down, go around another pulley, up and over another pulley, and come down, and then mount to the counterweight. And the reason for that is because you were able to double, you're able to double that stuff for lifting, because you need a heck of a drive system to lift an 80-ton counterweight. Now, the inspector, the tech who worked on it, told me, it says, it's 84 tons. So that was a discrepancy I had. I was like, why is it 84 tons? So out there, there was this big round thing sitting there that was just filled to the brim with tire weights, like you would balance a tire with. It's a little uh, half crescent moon shaped weight that goes on the tire. Well, from my racing experience, what we did is we would go to tire shops and we would get all the weights because that weight is lead. Lead is expensive, and it's a it's a heavy metal, so it's dangerous at the same time. So we would go get their used tire weights that they were going to have to pay money to dispose of, and we would actually take it, and we'd set up a special little assembly and use a torch with a rosebud on it, and we would melt that lead down into ingots, 50-pound ingots of weight that we could use for the race cars. So I have lots of experience melting tire lead, tire weight lead down. So I, I recognize when I go up to it, I'm like, wow, this thing is filled with tire weights. This, it's like a big, like a half bucket sitting there, but it's huge. And the person who used to work on it said, yeah, they wanted more weight. So the inside of the counterweight was filled with water. That was an interesting fact that I did not know. So it was filled with water on the inside. And I said, why water? He says, because you could take the plug out of it and essentially drain the counterweight to remove it, to do service work on it, to do whatever you wanted to. Now, 84 tons worth of, 80 tons worth of water is a lot. I'm not sure what the calculation is right off the top of my head but I can figure it out later. But 84 tons is a lot of water to put in there. But the thing is, is that once that counterweight was filled with water, at some point in time during the testing, commissioning, or perhaps even down the road, they wanted more weight. Well, they couldn't just refabricate that counterweight. They just didn't want to, like, the manufacturer wasn't around, it wasn't supported. So they couldn't just rebuild the counterweight so what they did is they put a basket on top of the thing and filled it with tire lead and added another five, six tons or whatever it was to that, or four tons to it. So I believe that was discrepancy between like the 80 and the 84 tons, somewhere in that. They added a handful of tons on top of it in tire lead and to make it heavier so it propelled the train faster. So that guy is in the back tower. One of the features of it, and one of the reasons that these counterweights are kind of weird, the whole back tower is kind of weird, is because these rides also had a nickname of Screamers. They were called Screamers. And the reason was is because that counterweight was tight in that cylinder. It, there, was, there wasn't much air gap all the way around it. And what there was on the bottom of the tube, all the way at the bottom not all the way, but I mean, a little bit of ways up, there was this big port, this big opening that sat there on the side of the tube. 
And this was an ingenious thing if it actually works. I honestly can't get anybody to confirm whether or not the counterweight was tight enough to the tube that this worked. They essentially took that back rear tube like this and the counterweight was the plunger and they essentially put it in the tube like that. And they said, okay, and they lifted it up to the top and that's where it started. So what was ingenious about the design was that if this worked the way it intended, that as it dropped, it had to displace all the air inside the tube. All this air had to go somewhere. A little bit slipped by the counterweight, or in this case, the plunger, a little bit slipped by but it was supposed to be not a lot. And again, I've got really no one to confirm this. This is theory of operation at this point in time. So the hole on the side of the tube down there would actually, could actually regulate part of the speed that the counterweight drops down that tube. So it can kind of be self-regulating. That was really interesting, but there's a lot that goes into that. I don't think, just personally, I don't think that aspect ever worked on those rides because the drastic change in air temperature from morning to afternoon to evening with humidity and everything else going on, I don't think you could have made a hole that was consistent enough to regulate that. But that's fine. One of the other things that happened was also super fascinating on it is that the hole wasn't at the very bottom. It was actually midway up, just a little ways up from the bottom. So what would happen is that as the counterweight dropped past that hole, it would suddenly pass the hole and then there was no more hole. So where does the air go? It couldn't go anywhere. So essentially what they did is like, if you're familiar with pneumatic actuators like uh, pistons, you essentially what he did is he, as that counterweight dropped down, he essentially plugged the hole right there and it became a spring. So the counterweight would drop past that hole and then suddenly that air had nowhere to go and he literally compressed the air underneath the counterweight as it was escaping past every little nook and cranny that it possibly could, would compress the air and help slow and stop the counterweight. That is incredible. <laughs> that is absolutely incredible. I was just trying to fathom this, this huge cylinder that's just suddenly, it's suddenly got pressure on the inside of it now. It was like, whoa. But a lot of that stuff, I take that whole tower with a grain of salt because I'm just like, it seems super precise to do. I don't know if it could be done. I don't know if it actually worked. If it was, if it was like one of those things, there's plenty of things on rides that are done in theory that never actually, people can't prove they are or are not working. So this might be one of those things. That's might be why I never got anybody to actually say, yes, that's, that's what's going on. Um, Underneath the counterweight, there is a giant spring. So when it reaches the bottom, if it ever reached the bottom, it would essentially have a little bit of a soft cushion before it stopped completely. Uh, the counterweight had sets of guide wheels all around it to keep it centered in the cylinder so it didn't scrape the walls going side to side. The tech who worked on the thing told me, he says, that was the sketchiest thing that he had ever had to do out there was basically you had to, from the top, you had to go in and adjust the, the guide wheels to where the, the thing was in the center, which doesn't sound bad at all. You had to climb in the space and work in there, uh, but you can lower it down and you can say, okay, it's down and take a ladder down, whatever it is, and you could get in there. From the bottom, however, there was an access port that was bolted shut and you had to unbolt it and then you had to go in underneath the 84 ton counterweight suspended overhead to adjust the guide wheels. That didn't sound like fun to me at all. That's, I, I don't know if I could do that. 
go into pretty much a confined space with nothing really locking the thing up. I'm sure they did something to lock it up there, probably use some uh, a bunch of chains and come-alongs and stuff to support the weight on the top side to ensure it couldn't move down further, but you never know with some of that older stuff. Yeah. So moving outside of, that's, that's the back tower, that's the counterweight tower, that is essentially the motor of the ride. So moving out from that, there was a cable attached to it, and the cable was pretty beefy. I mean, that thing was like, that was sitting in the parking lot. That, that thing was like two and a half inches in diameter. Looked like a Lang Lay cable. If you're used to dealing with cables, there's, there's a couple different types, but most cables are right hand lay. Lang Lay, they're not twisted that tight. They're very loose and it allows a lot of strength in the cable, but allows to go over pulley sheaves really fast, which is what this had to do. So that looked to me like a Lang Lay cable sitting there I was like that big around, like the size of a soda can in the center. It was like, oh, that guy was big. Anyways, it wrapped around those pulleys I was talking about up the top, and then it came back down, and then it was a straight shot right to the end of the launch track where it wrapped around a drum. Now, the drum underneath the track had that thing that would curl up on there. This is where it starts to get complicated the winching package for that had a combination of a clutch and a sprag. So there was two different things there. So the sprag attached the drum to the drive pulley. The drive pulley is the part that the launch cable is wrapped around. That's what the bob hangs on to to accelerate the car. So that's that's the drive cable. We'll call that the launch cable, drive cable, whatever you want to call it. Okay, so you have this drum sitting off to the side that had a big opening wound up for that big that big counterweight in the back tower. And what would happen is that on the outside of that, there was a giant clutch. Now, if you've seen the shuttle loops with a flywheel, it's uh, those, those flywheels use two clutches, one on each side. Well, the one they used apparently on the weight drop was one clutch, but it was much bigger because it had to do all that work by itself. You had that clutch on that drum. And the way that would work is that you would turn on the, the DC motors at the end. And the DC motors, gotten conflictions here as well, the print says two, people have told me three. Not sure what it is, honestly, but those DC motors would sit there through big planetary drive gearboxes and turn a big ring gear. The ring gear on the opposite side of it held the clutch. So you had motors, planetary drives, then the ring gear with the clutch right next to it. And what would happen is that it would engage the clutch, air pressure would push the clutch together and it would lock it, which clutches are basically just a set of friction plates that push together like a brake calipers on a car. So, except for the whole assembly rotates. So they push air pressure into that thing and it would lock the clutch together and then those motors would be turning already and it would be turning that clutch. Basically, the whole assembly turned counterclockwise or if you're looking at the drum from the top of the track, it turned the drum backwards towards the station. So it turned it counterclockwise so it could lift the counterweight. And when they energized that clutch, that drum would start turning backwards and it would start pulling all the cable in and as it pulled that cable in, that counterweight would start to rise. It would rise all the way up in the back until it hit proximity sensors at the top of it. And then once the proximity sensors at the top said, I'm good, stop. At that point, the motors that were driving the clutch stopped. They have brakes on them, the brakes turned on. Now, the clutch is huge, the counterweight's huge, but DC motors, through a planetary drive gearbox 
you could use very small brakes to hold that whole assembly because the planetary drive is just a ridiculous amount of reduction. So the mechanical leverage on that is huge. Like one little tiny brake can do a lot when it's through a planetary drive and had two to three of them in this case that were going through there. So the brakes on the motors is what held the clutch and was what's held the counterweight up in the back. So it would sit there and say, okay, my counterweight's at the top. Now, we move away from that, and now we move into the opposite side of the drum. On the opposite side of the drum, the drum was on the shaft, which was on the same shaft with the launch pulley, launch wheel. Um, there's technical names for these things, but they're all in German. They translate a little bit, I don't like the name of it, so I'm just going to keep with what, what I've got going. I apologize if that offends people. Um, and I know I'll get comments with all the names. Here's, here's the name, and here's what it is, and here's the name, and there's what it is. It's like, thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> uh, part of this I wanted to do is that I wanted, I so wanted to get all this information down and script it, but man, I am just so boring when I read a script so boring when I read a script, but I get all those technical names in there when I do read scripts, right? Six and one half dozen in the other. So on the other side of that drum is that launch pulley or that launch sheave because it's driving. That sheave towards the center has a sprag. If you're not familiar with the term sprag, sprag means one way clutch. Now, our other clutch was air-operated. It was fibrous discs that had to push together and hold steel. But a sprag, when you say a sprag clutch, basically it also could be called a ratchet. It's got mechanical lobes on the inside. The way it works is the lobe is egg-shaped, and when you turn the two surfaces one way, that egg shape just rolls and allows both surfaces to pass each other. And it just sits there and continues to do that. And then when you try to roll the two surfaces backwards, that egg shape gets tall and wedged itself right inside there. So it's those egg shapes all the way around that work that allow that sprag to rotate one way and then it locks going the other way. Why is that important? Because right now we have our counterweight up at the top. The lifting assembly has stopped and it's holding the counterweight, but our vehicle isn't ready to launch. Our system's not ready to launch. So we have to get that all in there. So we're going to say that this is the morning time and we're starting this up and our acceleration sled, AKA Bob, Bob is somewhere out on the ride right now. It might be on the sheave at the far end next to the whole winch package, or it might be somewhere underneath the ride. We don't know. So what happens is that the launch cable assembly in the station, now we've gone away from there and we're back in the station, there is underneath the station, that is the tensioner mechanism, but what I'm getting at there is that on the side of the tensioner mechanism, there is another motor with a cable, with a, another pulley system that spins at a slower speed and it turns the pulley in the back. So that turns, it turns the launch cable, which turns the drive sheave. And now the drive sheave and the launch cable are all around, allowed to rotate direction of travel freely. They're allowed to rotate just fine. And it keeps driving it around. And now what's on, what we're looking at is that bob, that bob is now underneath the track. Now, if you've seen, this is different from a lot of people. A lot of people don't understand if you're looking at a flywheel model, the flywheel styles, the bob doesn't leave the track. It stays right there and then simply just reverses its direction. So what they did on the weight drops is they continued the bob forward and rolled it down underneath the track and then returned it all the way back to the other side. And then at the other end, it rolled up behind the train again. For the 
flywheel styles, there's an opening back there to do that, but mainly that's a service opening. It's where they can just access the bob. So we have this small motor turning those pulleys and rotating that launch cable, and it moves that bob down around the track until it comes up in the very back into a ready position. And it comes back up there and stops right behind the train. And it says, okay, I'm ready. This process takes a while to get from one side of the ride back to the other. So it comes back around there. It takes a long time. By the time the train is stopped and people have offloaded, people are getting on. Right about the time people start getting on, that's when that bob comes up and stops right behind the train. So that's sitting there waiting now. So now we used a small motor to drive the pulley sheaves forward, but the lifting is stopped, but it's the sprag that's going to be doing all the work here in just a minute. So let's move on from there. Talk about the bob since we're on the subject. The bob, also known as the acceleration sled, um, is a little tiny pusher that sits on top of the track the track down the center, the original style is a piece of box beam that was cut with a notch in the top. And that's all it was essentially. It was a piece of beam with a slot that ran all the way down the center. And the bob is essentially a plate that sits in that slot with eight wheels on it. Back to the beginning of the video, my understanding is eight wheels on the thing because I can't find pictures of it. The guy I used to work with said underneath the cable was just attached with big clevises on both sides. Really big bulky things that had lots of girth to them. Uh, but I said, well, how is that going around the drive sheave at the end? And he says it, it, the assembly was so big it didn't care. It was a minor little flex to that thing. It didn't care. It moved right around that assembly down at the end. I was like, oh, okay. So I thought it was something cool, slick, compact, you know, like a custom made welded together. It's like, nope, just big clevises that hold the thing underneath there. So the Bob is essentially a plate with four wheels on top. Looks like a little car with a little nose on the front and four wheels underneath the thing. That's it. Nothing to guide it. It simply just sits in the center. If you're familiar with my other videos I've done, like I talked about hydraulic launch coasters, when you deal with cables and acceleration, you pretty much line the top of the wheels up on both sides and you put them in line with each other. The cable's a straight line. Whatever you're dealing with in the center really can't deviate that far. So there's no need to really put extra wheels inside to guide stuff like that because it pretty much stays right there via cable tension, and if not the cable tension, the train is really precise fitted to the track at the same time. So it's no big deal there. So once that comes around and the bob stops, on the back side, there is a small brake that applies just to hold the cable assembly steady so it doesn't drift one side or the other. And then what that all is mounted to underneath the station is a tensioner mechanism Cables and tension are extremely critical. They run side by side with each other because what you're about to do is you're about to put a bunch of torque through that pulley down at the other end, through the sheave at the other end. When you put all that torque into that, the cable stretches. If you've seen the tensioner cable, or if you've seen the tensioner, if you've seen the tensioner wheel on something like King the Ka, Top Thrills, used to be Top Thrills. Uh, I have to call that ride the artist formerly known as Top Thrills. Or any hydraulic launch ride. If you see that thing launch, you'll see that tensioner wheel suddenly flops backwards and then kind of bounces like that as it stops. That's because that backwards motion that you're seeing, that is cable stretch. You gotta remember, cable's a big loop. It's like a rubber band, so we pull it and we make it nice and tight. And then when we take this in and drive it as hard as we can, the top ends just start stretching. The whole thing stretches like a rubber band. Well, it's got to go somewhere because if you don't tension that at the same exact time, well, the 
pulley slips at the other end. Your drive sheave no longer drives. It simply just slips. So you can't have that. So cable tensioning mechanisms are absolutely critical when you're talking about cables. And underneath the station is a very large tensioning mechanism. It is the full size of that sheave pulley on the other end sitting there on a big steel platform with wheels. And then it's got another cable coming off of it that wraps around some more pulleys and goes down to a set of weights. Again, the pulleys wrapping around is so that the weights actually do more work than they can, than they, than they are able to if it was just nothing, if it was just straight to it. So you put 500 pounds of weight on there. Let's make it interesting. You put 4,000 pounds of weight hanging off a single pulley where it just goes right to the back of that wheel. And you're pulling on that wheel now with 4,000 pounds of force. But for an assembly that big, it's like nothing. Like that's nothing. But if you run it through and double that, you could run it back in there. And that same 4,000 pounds is now pulling 8,000 pounds. You could wrap it through another time. Now it's pulling 16,000 pounds. You just keep doing that until you're pulling more and more and more weight. So pulleys and cables are pretty cool things. So that is the tensioner mechanism. That is what tensions the launch cable. So we have our counterweight at the back. We have our systems wound up and stopped. It's at the top. And we have our bob positioned in place now. The system is stopped. It's essentially ready to go when the operator is. So moving to the operator, it's a standard operator thing. So they let the air gates open to the ride and hopefully no one's leaning on the air gates, right? Watching you. Anyways, people get on the ride. Okay. They go ahead and on the side, there's unlock rails that are pushed out. They've unlocked the seats. The seats are up. So people sit down. They're ready to get in. They, they hit lock. Those rails retract into the side and the seats lock. So you could ratchet down the bar. There's just their mechanical ratchets as it goes down. Just ch -ch 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 -ch. You'll hear them nice and loud. And then the operators come by and check and they say, yep, 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 yep. Okay. Everyone's good to go. The platform's cleared off. The ride has a green. We're ready to go. So at that point, operation of these varies a little bit. So I'm going to put in a little bit of salt in this one right here. But at that point in time, you essentially hit, we're just going to say, we'll say dispatch. Now, underneath the station, there is another unlock rail, but a much smaller one. And it comes out and touches the side of the train, but only in the very, very, very back. And what happens back there is the launch dog essentially comes down in the back of the train. Now, this is hard to understand. Uh, so I made a CAD design here, cardboard aided design. There's my launch dog. It's cool, right? So this is the way it sits when the train is sitting in the station, ready to go. And it's like, okay. Then when they hit that dispatch, essentially, or like a, a pre-dispatch, I'll put the pin in it right there. Uh, the arm lever comes out and pushes on this assembly, not on it, but I mean, there's some mechanism on the inside, just a, a series of like, levers it pushes on it and causes to causes this guy to rotate to the down position like that and what happens is that you remember on the bob i said that it's you know four wheels and at the front it's got a little it's got a little nose on it well what happens is that when this guy is in the down position that nose of the bob comes right in and locks into this guy and holds it now now it knows that once this guy is down, it's extended out, it's censored, it says, okay, this is down, drive the bob forward. And that motor underneath releases its brake and says forward. So it drives the bob forward 
until its nose pushes on this guy. Now, what I didn't know before I did this video is that when it pushes on this guy, I thought maybe it just tensioned it right as it launched and did something like that. No, it doesn't. Actually, if you look in the station, there's two little brass bus bars that sit down in there. Originally, I thought those bars were the thing that actually caused this guy, the launch dog, to actually drop down. Uh, kind of like King Dakar Ka or one of those rides where they put electrical current to a solenoid and it comes down. Not the case, actually. So this is mechanically driven from the side of the station that tells it to come down. It's just a mechanical lever, pushes out, comes down. It retracts, it comes back up. So when it's in the down position and that bob is told to go forward, it pushes on this guy. It physically comes up to the back and you could see it on videos. It comes up to the back and as soon as it makes contact, you'll see this guy push in just a little bit. You'll see it push in just a little tiny bit. What I found out is that there's a limit switch on the back side of this thing. It's not a chewy limit switch. Ignore that. But it's a limit switch on the back side. And it pushes that guy in and makes the limit switch. That's what's connecting on the bus rails underneath. That limit switch signal. So it says advance the bob and it advances until the limit switch is made and it breaks the electrical signal and then it says stop. I've advanced far enough and I know that the bob is now engaged with the launch dog in the back of the train. That's cool. And then at that point the ride is ready and then as soon as the operators press their buttons essentially the brakes in the station release and at the other end, way down there, there's a couple things that happen simultaneously. And it's, it's interesting. The brakes release, all the brakes, everywhere, including those DC motors way at the other end that are holding that pesky little 84 ton counterweight in that chamber. Those release too. Now what happens is remember the sprag on the drive sheave. Now what happens is that 84 ton counterweight starts to fall. That cable starts to unwind that drum. Well, that sprag doesn't want to turn that direction. It wants to stop rotation. So that sprag, as soon as that shaft starts to turn, that sprag locks. And that sprag is met with a lot of resistance because it's got this big drive sheave and this big cable attached to the train at the other end. So, you put your hands up and you start riding and you go wee as that thing starts to accelerate the catch the uh the counterweight starts to drop further and further down and as it goes further and further everything gains mass and momentum it starts accelerating faster and faster and faster and faster pretty cool right once you get to some proxes down at the end it says okay i'm done accelerating once it's done accelerating, what's it do? Starts the whole process over again. What's incredible about this process that is just absolutely amazing to watch. Like I saw this on those videos by David and stuff. And I, I just like, I had to stop and just keep watching the same couple seconds just over and over and over again, because my brain was just mechanically melting down with what was happening in this video. So, at the very beginning, when we said we're going to release all the brakes to start the launch process, we opened all the brakes. And then as soon as the brakes on those DC motors started, as soon as they released, the clutch also opened, which allowed free movement of everything. And then at the same time, those DC motors turned on and started turning backwards again. So as soon as the train starts to launch, those DC motors turn on and start turning backwards. It gets all that assembly up to a nice speed and it sits there and just hums right along and says, yep, I'm going, I'm going, I'm going. And then once it hits those proximity sensors down at the end and the bob hits those sensors and it says, okay, I'm ready to stop, several brakes lock up. So the brake on the drive sheave locks up and brings the cable to a stop the launch cable to a stop. At the same time, the clutch 
engages and the clutch has now actually grabbed that 84 ton counterweight again in one motion and stopped it from dropping and is now lifting it back up again. Really super interesting to watch at full speed because you'll see it sitting there, you'll see the clutch rotating backwards and you'll see the drum spooling out going forward. So you have clutch going this way, the drum going this way, and then in one motion, the thing just goes along, just going out, 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 backwards. And it just starts going again. It's like, wow, the amount of friction that has to happen there to stop that counterweight and pull it back up at the same time. Just mind-blowing, absolutely mind-blowing. So now, we've once that cable is told to stop, the brakes apply. We are now lifting the counterweight back up. Now the little motor underneath the station, the little motor that could, it turns back on and starts to drive the drive sheaves back around and it starts turning the launch cable. That's where you see at the very end, you'll see that bob go out just a little bit further and then it goes underneath the track because the bob comes right back down and goes underneath the track and gets ready to, to go back the other way. So as a safety, Schwarzkopf said they wanted the bob off the launch track. They did not want it there because maybe they were worried about like what happens if the launch dog were to stay down and grab a hold of that thing. It would be detrimental, be bad. So what they did with the launch dog, this was it, right? And the bob locked in right here is that once that thing retracted back into the station, it has levers and springs on the inside that automatically shift it back to this position. Well, the reason why it's got this big notch up here is because this is a counterweight. Without those levers and springs in there, with none of that stuff working, it still goes back to that position. You say, why do we care about this position? Because here, the bob is engaged right here. We locked the bob in and we said we're pushing the train now. Great. And then fault, anything like that, doesn't matter what it is. Let's say halfway through the launch, the, the system messes up and the bob comes disengaged. As soon as the bob comes out of there, as soon as the nose comes out of there, the launch dog just goes back up. Okay, still, why do I care about that? Because when it comes backwards off that tower, because you're going to go through the loop, up, and now you're coming up backwards. When you come backwards through that tower, this guy is in this position. So if the bob is still on the track, it will pass safely right underneath this guy. The train will pass safely over it. Nothing will happen. Now, for people that grew up with the flywheel style rides, this is nothing new because that's all flywheel style rides do, is they simply just lift this guy up at the end, let the train go through the loop, up that back spike, come back, and it goes right back over the bob. Every time you could see it as you're going backwards, there you go right back over the bob, no big deal. On the first version of the ride though, on that, on that weight drop style ride, they were worried about it passing over the bob. I believe that's the reason why they pushed the bob over the end and they said, hey, let's go back that way instead of just reversing the cable, which also would have added cost because at that point you couldn't reverse the sprag. It doesn't work that way. So you would have had to literally put another clutch in so that the launch cable could go backwards, adding a significant amount of cost again, not to mention working components. So it was much more simpler simply just to push the bob around. So let's talk about the loop. The loop was unique for Schwarzkopf. Why is it unique? What, look at the loop. What do you see on that loop? Looks kind of like a B&M, right? It's got the square back to it. That's really interesting. Why did it have a square back to it? Well, all of Schwarzkopf's designs before that were a lattice style, a trellis style loop where they had lots of small tubes crisscrossing over it, overarching, and they, they went off in all directions to support the loop. Now, with this big, beefy, square 
backbone design going over that loop, they didn't have to have all that stuff. That loop was truly just freestanding in one spatial plane like that. Very strong, very rigid. Unlike a B&M though, where B&Ms use flange to flange connection where they bring them down and then put bolts all around the outside, Schwarzkopf's were rectangular, they were kind of, they're square, but they were hollow on the inside. So they used budding plates, which is just a big plate with a ton of holes in it. And what they did is they put ones on the inside and then they would push bolts through and then tighten them down. What that meant is that if you ever look at those loops, those joints in that style track for them, you'll see these round holes that are got plates bolted all over them. Those holes are actually access holes. If you want to check the torque on those fasteners, you have to take that plate off in order to reach your hand on the inside to hold the back side of the fastener while you check the torque on the outside. So much more complicated to put together. A little bit more wiggle room inside those things too. Definitely not a flange to flange connection like a B&M. Those are much more rock solid. These were kind of like, they were still plate steel. That's even kind of thin when you compare it to something like what we build these days. We I should say what B&M builds these days. They're still kind of a little on the flimsy side comparative. So let's talk about the train a little bit. The train is your standard train. There's really nothing about it. I got nothing to say there really. On the outside of the train, it kind of looks like a premier style train that uses a LIM launch. So you see those trains like on Poltergeist and things like that where the fins stick off to the side. Well, those were the brake fins for the Schwarzkopf's. So the brake fins would stick off to the side. On a lot of them, what they did is they reversed standard braking theory, which we have today, which is where when we build stuff today, we put the brass lining on the brake skis that are on the track. And then the train has a consumable fin that goes through there. The way Schwarzkopf did it is he used steel liners on the side and then on those fins that stick out, he lined them both sides with this phenolic type material. So it didn't chew through the steel as fast and the outside was consumable. So essentially looking at the train was your brake wear. Those designs aren't that great because the brakes are long and they kind of go up and down as the thing passes by. And if you have one coach with new lining on it, up against a coach that has like next to nothing left on it, the braking force is going to be diminished in that area. Not to mention you're going to wear down your new stuff a lot faster than the old stuff is for sure. So a little, little more complicated. Those are little minor nuances for that thing. But on the outside, they're essentially just two sets of skis that line both sides of the track in that area. And they are a canister style brake assembly which is like you find on a big rig tractor or something like that they have big springs on the inside pushing the two forces away which through a fork that crosses in the center they essentially clamp like this and then you put air pressure in that canister to override the springs and it compresses the assembly back down and allows the brakes to open so if you were to blow an airline lose power anything like that all the brakes slam shut. The brakes were complicated though. This was kind of like a boomerang. Boomerangs, you have to, when they come backwards through the station, they have to be adjusted to where you let the train go out the station, but not shoot out the station. And then you have to adjust them to where they slow the train down, but not too far. Either way, if you let it shoot out, or don't slow it or slow it down too much the train undershoots it doesn't home well it's the same problem there there's nothing in the station to drive the train back to its home position so as the train comes back off the front tower goes backwards through that loop so much fun to go backwards through that loop i don't know what it was about schwarzkopf loops they're amazing though then you come back down now not that entire launch area is lined with brakes so you get about three quarters of the way back towards that station and then you start hitting brakes and then proximity sensors timers kick in as it essentially trims 
the train. So it comes back in and you hear that thing go ta 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 as it comes starts coming through brakes and then you'll hear them all open and then it lets the train coast backwards through to the back tower. Once it clears the station, you'll hear those brakes shut. Train goes up the back tower, loses momentum, comes back in. Again, you hear it go tat 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 into the brakes. All the brakes open and then lets the train come back in. And then there's some pulsing that's done off of some proximity sensors and stuff in there. Just like a boomerang would, it comes in and kind of does a pre-pulse to try to slow the train down just a little bit more. And then it arrives at home and locks back up. At that point in time, the unlocks come back in on the side of the train, you get off. Super fun rides, very impressive to look at once you know how they work, they're even more impressive. Watching the videos about how that stuff worked is amazing. Just the amount of energy that's changing hands between that launch cable, the train, and that counterweight in that rear tower. I should say front tower. Why do I always say rear tower? I don't know why. So amazing. Some minor odds and ends of things to talk about. So between that winch package underneath the launch track all the way to that back tower, you have that big cable that's strung like a guitar string all the way out there the entire time. That guy has guide wheels, it's guide rollers, that keep the cable from hopping up and down too far. Cables like to bounce as you start using them. So they have guide rollers all the way down there that keep it kind of top to bottom and left to right in the same general relative area as it's being pulled. The cable on the back side as it goes up and over to the tower, it's got tack generators mounted on those pulleys that monitor the speed at which the thing is falling. So it is possible to fall too fast. Why would it fall too fast? Good question. I thought about it, not having someone really here to pick their brain about it. I just had to kind of think about the assemblies and how they work. Essentially, you can fall too fast if your launch dog breaks and you suddenly lose all the, mo you lose the train essentially. It's like, huh, no more train and it just goes. You'll go too fast. Also, the sprag that's underneath the drive sheave, that is letting the drive sheave only turn that one way. If you break the sprag and it's that sheave is now allowed to free spin, same thing. You lose the resistance load of that cable. It takes off running. So that has its own runaway system to where if it sees any of that stuff, it locks everything up and stops. And by lockup, I mean e-stop lockup. It takes all the power, all the pressure away from everything. Actually, that would be reversed for the clutch because you would need power to hold the clutch open, essentially, to allow it to free spin. When you lose power, it would slam the clutch shut. And the clutch, I imagine, I don't know this for sure, don't know it, but I imagine the clutch has its own air pressure backup reservoir just in case you blow an airline. Don't know. When you're talking about the drive cable with the bob on it that goes around the sheave and the idler pulley back there, um, or the tensioner pulley, that also has its own overspeed mechanism attached to that as well. It's got tack generators placed on that guy, so it knows if the train is going too fast. How could the train go too fast? Well, that is possible as well, because at the end of the track, you hit those proximity sensors and they release and it tells that whole system to lock up. Well, what happens if they don't? The system just keeps going. I imagine there's a couple proximity sensors there as double checks, but you also have a critical speed that once the train gets up to that fast pace, it shuts the system back down because it's like something is wrong. And this is a very finite movement back there, but it was put into practice one time, not in a good way either, because the technician who worked on the one said there was one time when he got the ever so bad call where he, his words, not mine, he got a call from one of his buddies and said, hey, we need 
uh, he, he needed to come in or something to help work on the tidal wave. And he said, why? And they said, it rung the bell. If you've never heard that phrase before, imagine a high striker game where you hit it and it goes whooping, hits the top. Well, these rides that are shuttle launch coasters like these that have open-ended track at both ends, they have big bumpers on top of them that are way over designed just in case for some reason you ever went over speed and you for some reason over the train and once you over the train it goes too fast you always get up close to that bumper at the end but never hit it not never but that ride one time did ring the bell it went up there and actually tagged that bumper and i never heard what the actual problem was with that but I could think of like, well, if you were driving that train forward, you didn't have to necessarily go over speed at the very end of the launch track when you told the clutch to close. And now it was going into that backwards DC motor to lift the counterweight back up. So when you told that clutch to close, it didn't for some reason, which is not that hard to think of. I mean, you could have a slow acting valve or something like that back down there that would prevent that clutch from slamming shut. And if it just mildly closed, well, there's enough time in there theoretically where it could have continued to accelerate that train that much further. Now, again, down there, stopping that whole system is the fail safe. So, but you're already talking when you're at 99% out of a hundred, that's your, that's your window down there. It wasn't a very good fail safe window, but that was the fail safe window. So, because in that portion of the track, there's no brakes out there. So it's, if you hit e-stop, all it does is stop the drive system. It doesn't stop the train because there's no brakes out there. So there was one time that he told me that it did go up there and ring the bell, which was not great, but weird things happen, especially with those older rides where they're operating in that little tiny safety window right there at the very end. And this was a groundbreaking ride when it was built. So it's not like it had been done for many years. Um, the U-shaped coasters, impulse coasters and stuff I worked on, where they have open-ended track, I mean, there is a ton of safeties every which way. They basically know that the entire time that train is driving exactly what it's going to do on the other end. This process didn't seem to be that exact. It used tachometers and things like that to produce voltage signals that had to be within certain windows not too high but not too low anywhere outside of that and it stops it but if the system is going runaway at the end how are you going to stop that i mean there's the reason why it's run away is because it didn't stop there is one ride that i know of it's over in Brazil, I think it was. It was relocated from another park, which was relocated from another park. It is, as far as I know, in operation, and it is a, it is a legitimate weight drop ride. Now, if you notice on some of these weight drop rides, also the flywheel launch rides too, you see the original had this very narrow little trough down the center for the bob to ride on, and the newer reiterations had these really big, wide, plates with a bunch of bolts holding it down well like i said in the beginning that launch trough that the bob rode on was just a piece of steel box steel that was cut on the top well that can only take so much flexing and every time the train drives down there it does flex a little bit as it drives down there because it's got it's got both downward and upward force from the bob trying to twist like that so those things wear out and they had to be cut and they had to be cut out. Well, did they re-weld the same little 10 millimeter plate of steel back on top of it? No, they retrofitted. So they went in between the ribs and they welded on more supports, more brackets on both sides. And then they took where that bob was, they cut all that apart a little bit further and now they've got big beefy plates, not thick because they didn't really change the bob from what I understand. So they weren't very thick, but now there are these bolt-on plates. And now if they find cracks or anything in it, they simply just unbolt the plates and bolt new plates back down. No cutting, no welding, no nothing. In fact, they can change them out every couple years if they want to, because all they have to do is just build new ones. Not a big deal. 
That's pretty slick. I'm recording this video right around the time that uh, they just made an announcement a little while back about that they're gonna that they are gonna relaunch Montezuma's Revenge at Knott's Berry Farm uh, as something like we don't know what that's gonna be like, but that'll be interesting. But that's kind of sad to see. That was a flywheel style, but uh, it's just. Heartbreaking any time they take down an icon like that, but I know it's part of the industry. It's stuff that just needs to happen. They can't stay living forever, but it still hurts a little bit inside, you know, when they, when people do stuff like that. I think I've talked at you for way too long, but I've really enjoyed this video. I had so much fun researching it. Go check out some of those other videos if you like these weight drop style videos. Um, go check out some of those other ones because they are super cool as well. I honestly can't wait to hear the comments in these because I get people from uh, ride operators to, you know, I mean, not present, I mean like former ride operators that that was their ride, that was their baby, engineers that worked on that. I got people, I knew people that did design work and stuff like that for those things and they like to pop in on the comments and, and say, mostly it's to correct my poor everything, but... <laughs> <laughs> they, they'll they come in and, and lay the truth down in there and say, yeah, yeah, this is what that's actually called. Nope, this is what that actually does. And some of these gray areas maybe get cleared up down there in the comments, which is just awesome because uh, any for any other YouTubers out there, it's like you could take this knowledge now and you could take those comments now, let's say down the road, and you could now put even more of it together and people that are better off doing YouTube stuff than I am, where they actually do animation and things like that, be pretty sweet video to watch. So uh, I hope you've enjoyed it. I really do. I'm Ryan the Ride Mechanic, and as always, stay off the air gates. Bye.